it feels to me like it's rehearsed sometimes. Yeah. And I do oh, I like is. to get away from that whenever possible. It is rehearsed for sure. It yeah. is. I mean, this is not rehearsed. Right. Believe me. I've never told this story in public. Oh, really? Yay. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a good story. You should but, tell it in uh, public. No. This is Really Famous. I'm Kara Mayer Robinson, and I interview famous people. But I don't just interview them like your typical interview. I'm not really interested in those same old questions. Instead, I like to know who they really are and what they really think. This week, I'm sitting down with actor and filmmaker Polly Draper. If you're like me, when you hear the name Polly Draper, you think of Ellen Warren, the really special character she played on the TV series 30-something, which um, was a great show, by the way. Anyway, Polly is busy with other things, too. She just wrote, directed, and stars in a new film that's winning all kinds of awards on the film festival circuit. It's called Stella's Last Weekend. You can catch it on demand now. It's a sweet and funny movie, and it also stars her two real-life sons, Alex and Nat Wolf. Now, Nat and Alex are also famous. They were the stars of a movie and TV series that ran on Nickelodeon, called the Naked Brothers Band, and in fact, it was actually Polly who wrote, directed, and produced them. Getting back to 30-something, I've actually met a few of Polly's co-stars who've been on Really Famous, Peter Horton, a.k.a. Gary Shepard, and Timothy Busfield, who played Elliot Weston. If you haven't heard their episodes, you can listen to them at any time. I put links in today's episode notes. So here's Polly and me recently talking in New York. Um, We talk a lot about dogs and get some scoop on David Letterman. She teaches me a little bit about being a director and so much more. It's very much a two people talking about regular things episode. And she also shares her thoughts about 30 something that I had never even considered. So here we are, Polly Draper and me, enjoy. Jane the Virgin. Do you know that show? Yeah, uh, my friend Melanie Mayron directs that show. She does? She does. <clears throat> yeah. That's so interesting. I yeah. did not know that. Yeah. So Melanie Mayron, who was also with you um, in 30-something. 30 30 something. Mm-hmm. Uh, by the way, I'm going off off topic right now. Yeah. So I've already talked to a couple of your uh, 30-something friends. Oh, you have? Yeah, on the show. Which ones? So Tim Busfield. Tim, yeah. So he was a guest on Really Famous, nice. I don't know, six months ago or something. Nice. And then last time I was in L.A., I interviewed Peter Horton. In no way. Yes. I just saw both of them because there was some 30-something... Uh, a reunion, um, right? Reun- it wasn't even, uh, yeah, it was like um, South by Southwest was doing like a tribute to us. And uh, it was so much fun to see everybody again. Because we don't, we see each other separately, but we, together, it's really fun when we get back So to you here. see Melanie a lot separately? Or? Melanie, I mostly, is the one I see separately. And is she in New York as well or no? No, she's in L.A., but I go to L.A. back and forth. And a lot. So we, our kids kind of grew up together and... So we see each other most. It, they both said the same thing. Like Tim told me, you guys are all really close when you see each other. And yeah. he told me a story that when he goes out to L.A., because he's also like New York and Michigan, and then he'll go to L.A. for right. things. And he said he'll go to L.A. and he'll visit Ken Olin yeah. and, Patty. Uh, and Patty. And they'll go out to a restaurant or something together, like right. the three of them in a booth. And like I'm like, how, what will people do if they see the three of you in a booth together? Like I think they would go insane. Like oh when my god! They, when we're all together, they do. They go insane. Um, but we're old now, so it's not exactly like they're. <laughs> I still think the it's pretty darn cool. The people going insane are like half dead. So <laughs> <laughs> they're they're uh, insane for a whatever sixty year old is more like hey. <laughs> Dirty something, right? <laughs> that, that is not that is not sixty. Nice try. But how old are the fans? Do you think did people who are older than thirty something mm-hmm. generally and watch younger. it? It was. A, I was in college and I watched. Yeah. I I was obsessed with it. Loved yeah. it. There were a lot of people younger that watched it. What so older as well? Oh yeah, well older and younger and in between. You know, it was a really popular show. It was a it was a show that. In its time, since there are only three networks, 
well, maybe there were four, um, was... Are we including Fox as a network? Right, including Fox, which is, yeah, right? It was just fledgling. <laughs> it didn't have a bad connotation Yeah, here we then. go again with oh, Fox. Oh. Oh. It was just a little baby network then. Anyway. Well, if we're going to include Fox, let's include, like, um, Channel 11 it was. What is that? Uh, like, the WB. Was that at the same time that Fox came up or no? You know I don't what I'm think the about? WB was there. It wasn't. Mm-mm. So I just think that Fox came then? a little later. Okay. Yeah. I don't. I'm not sure, but I don't think. So. Oh, um, well, my husband was on the Arsenio Hall show, which was. Oh, that was was that the that was eleven Paramount, or nine, and that was eleven. That was eleven. So that which was is just the WB or the CW? Aren't they yeah. the same thing? Do you know what I'm talking about? Mm-hmm. I know the. CW, so what was the Arsenio Hall show on? All the, all the, it was just not syndicated, so it was on a bunch of different. Oh, it just okay. was so popular that it was on a bunch of different networks. I think Got it. Was it. The Paramount Network did. Anyway, so it was thirty something was very niche market at the time, but if you think about nowadays, more people watch thirty something than watch even Game of Thrones or whatever you think of the big. Um, shows so it was a very um, it, it was a different time so when you were niche famous then you were you were m- much more famous than now what niche famous means because there's so many different options on television that's true right there are a yeah. lot of famous there wasn't people really HBO there wasn't you know there were right weren't. well HBO back then was what probably movies they were playing mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe a couple of shows. I, I feel like there were some. Sh- were there I think shows? So, like, wasn't there like a therapist guy or something? Um, I may be thinking of the wrong thing. Jonathan Katz or something. Do you know what I'm talking about? Mm-mm. I don't know. I'll have to look up my facts. But right, so HBO wasn't really. Yeah. Well, it certainly wasn't anything like it is now. No, it was pre Sopranos. Yeah, pre Sopranos. Exactly, pre Sopranos HBO. So anyway, it was massively successful for um, upwardly mobile white people with kids. And then everybody else knew about it. I know that um, Damon Wayans, I think, or told me that he was um, on Living Color, and they, they thought about doing a skit that was called 30-something to life about people in jail talking about their feelings <laughs> because 30-something was very easy to parody because it was very, uh, you know... Angsty. Angst, angsty about little things right but it was honestly the first time anyone had ever talked about a lot of things like first time two gay people had been in bed together first time anyone talked about birth control first time anybody had seen anybody's naked butt it was like wait really i remember the scene was a big deal with the two men the two gay men in bed was a big i remember it was all over the news yeah i don't remember the birth control what was the last she thing? She said, he said, I'll pull out. And she said, I'm wearing my diaphragm. And it was, they almost who cut was, it. Who was this? Mel and Ken. Uh, um, Hope and Michael. Oh, Hope and Michael. But it was, and that was a big scandal. It was, um, or scandal, whatever. Anyway, they. And what was the third thing? Oh, um, oh naked my butt? naked. Was your naked, naked butt? butt? Yeah. Ah. In a swimming pool. And it was, they, all the advertisers pulled out. And <laughs> I know, it's like, God, that's insulting. Really? <laughs> they really did pull out from that episode because of that, mm-hmm. but they still decided to do it. No, uh, actually, that one they did. They, they, uh, they got rid of. They cut the scene. They didn't cut the scene. They just uh, cut away from the the butt. Oh, so you didn't actually show your butt on TV? Exactly. Oh, but you I filmed didn't. it. Yeah, but then David Letterman showed a clip of my actual butt on TV just to mess with me. <laughs> So did you know that going in, though, when you were going out to Letterman? And did I they had tell you? so many experiences with David Letterman that were just so funny and terrible. He, he um, I, I was his old girlfriend's good friend, Meryl Marco. And so he, whenever there was someone who dropped out of David Letterman, he'd call me up to come on because he knew that it would be an, an entertaining segment <laughs> because he could, I don't know. Well, this one time I, uh, I was out of things to say because I'd, I'd been on a bunch and, and I'd used up all my stories and they said something like, um, well, have you traveled a lot? 
have you traveled recently? This is a pre-interviewer, and I said, I had already told them my story about when I went to Russia, and that was kind of an interesting story, and I'd already told them about, you know, other travels I'd taken that were interesting, and I told them about my dogs, and I told them about my pet alligator, and I told them about, I mean, I had so many things that I'd already told them about, so, so I decided to use someone else's story. <laughs> my dad worked for the UN, and he went to Cuba and had dinner with Castro, and they had uh, they made a bet over who would take over Nicaragua and um, and he and Castro and Castro lost and welched on the bet whatever anyway I thought it was kind of a fun interesting story and I didn't say I, I thought well my dad's taken me to a lot of the trips that he's gone to in different foreign countries I'll just pretend I also went to that trip so I'll so I just said, yeah, and then I told the story about, you know, my dad and Castro and all this stuff, and, and there I was at the dinner, and all David Letterman wanted to hear about was, like, what did you eat? And did Castro get food in his beard? What does his voice sound like? What did, and I was like, oh, fuck, oh, fuck. <laughs> No, I don't know anything. Not only <laughs> just anything about Cuba, I don't know anything about Castro. I don't know anything about anything. He, when he asked me what we had for dinner, I said, you know, just like Mexican food. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, oh my God, this is hell. And my mother and father were watching my appearance and my father was like, she should get punished for this. And my mother is like, <laughs> I think she's getting punished right now. <laughs> yes. And then later I said something about how my dad had been made a, a chief in Somalia and they'd given, they'd killed three pigs in his honor and stuff. And David Letterman says, Polly, I went with you on the Cuba thing. I don't believe you. About this. <laughs> and I'm like, I wanted to say that one is actually true. <laughs> So he knew the whole time. He was just like I think he you. saw that. That yeah. yeah. I think he saw my eyes spinning around in my head. Realized this is. He asked what hotel I stayed at. I mean, he asked me too many questions, catching me up in lies. To, I said, hotel presidente. <laughs> a good guess hotel nacional would probably work better <laughs> so it was it was really really uh, it was it was hell anyway. so wait so what about the butt then how did he what did he do oh, with that so then he just played the actual clip of the butt and said this is ridiculous why is abc not allowing this on their he did it like a and then my sister called and said, you're getting to be like Cher. You're just going out there in these interview shows. I can't believe they showed your butt. <laughs> I'm like, God, they're, really? They were going to show it in the, they were going to show it in the, uh, in the actual episode. Anyway, so that was that. So how many times were you on Letterman then? Do you know? Like, yeah, I was four or five. That's a yeah. lot. I know. I was on a lot but because of that thing where important people drop right. out. And, and then that you happens just call. all the time. Yeah, he did it for with Terry Gar for a while, and then he did it with me for a while. I did a lot of them. So, did you know him outside because of your no, friend? No, no one does. No Except one he does. Did. I mean, some people do, but he came to my dressing room to say hi to me before, which apparently was a big deal. Oh. Yeah, most people they don't. Um, they, so you would they just... don't ever see him and except out on the uh, tar tarmac. That's it. <laughs> he doesn't say hi or bye or anything like that, and nobody mm -hmm. knows him in real life. I mean, yeah. Unless they're, they're, you know, but that was, friends. but, but your friend was his girlfriend. So if yeah. anyone's going to know him, so if you don't even know him, right. then that I was says in a, a lot. Uh, Meryl did a, uh, she did a little, uh, comedy, I guess you'd say a little comedy movie sketch thingy. And he was in one of the sketches and I was in one of the sketches. But other than that, no, not Nothing. in real life. That's so interesting. It's funny because I always think about like late night TV is sort of the opposite from what I do. It's like the polar opposite. Yeah, you get more intimate. Yeah, I get more intimate. It's long. It's unrehearsed. I don't really know what we're going to talk about ahead of time. Yeah. And it's like as real as we were talking about it before. It's as real as I can make it, meaning I'm trying to have like a real conversation and so that people listening get a really a good feel for who you really are. Yeah. And I feel like that's the opposite of late night. So it's always very interesting to me when I hear stories about what it's like to go on yeah. a late night show. 
No, that's that's more like being a stand-up comic. You have right. to kind of get your material set beforehand, funny stories, hone them, and and go on. You so know. what happens? You get a call from the booker, I guess, right? Because so even though he knew he was asking for you, he wasn't asking you directly. <laughs> Oh, exactly. And and probably the booker just knows knew that I had a good rapport with him and he hadn't complained about me. So right. they it was probably he doesn't know. He probably is just like but I do know that with the Cuba thing, the just before I went out because I told I thought I told a lot of stories that could have been the lead off stories in that episode in but um and by the way, I cannot find it online. I can't find that the, everyone has tried to because uh, when I've told that story to my friends they've all tried to look for it I can't find it so, so did it not happen he may have is it possible? oh no it happened <laughs> oh believe me I have many witnesses to tell you that <laughs> right <happened. laughs> your dad and your mom for sure uh, so, so you think he pulled it like yanked it somehow I don't know there's a lot of things you can't find on the internet but yeah. so this is what this is uh the late show or is it um, late, night late, late night with David Letterman. Letterman. So it's yeah. late night with David Letterman. Mm-hmm. I, I bet. So, but nobody can find it. You're saying not the, well not to the, everyone listening. Let's see if anyone can find yeah. it. Let, let <laughs> that us would know. Be awesome. <laughs> yeah, reach out to me and I'll tell Holly because I would love to see it just and look at it with like you know a stiff drink. Right. <laughs> Very memorable. So you'll okay. So you'll go in. You'll get a call from the booker. You'll go in, and what you have, you practice a few things, like a few stories before you go in, and then you present them in the pre-interview. Or like, mm-hmm. walk me through that. Yeah. The, no, the pre-interviewer just talks to you like you're talking to me and asks you, you know, what's been going on, la 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 la, and you you've some somehow been thinking about different things that might be interesting funny unusual things to say on a talk show so you kind of go into it with but I remember my first talk show I went on and um and I had no idea that you're supposed to lead the conversation so they would say so you're from New York and I'd say "Mm -hmm." (laughs) and it was terrifying because you saw them look nervous and I thought well why you're supposed to ask me questions right right so uh, yeah you have to figure out how to lead the conversation and right which talk show was that the first one well I know that it was I think it was Joan Rivers talk show but she wasn't there it was an alternate host and he looked nervous anyway right I imagine she would run with that somehow she would be Oh, yeah. You're from New York. <laughs> exactly. She'd yeah. go into her own shtick. Yeah. Um, so then you learn how to lead it, which is good and important. At the same time, sometimes I'll, I'll be honest, sometimes I'll be with somebody interviewing them and they're so used to taking the lead and running with it that it feels to me like it's rehearsed sometimes. Yeah. And I do, oh, oh, I like is. to get away from that whenever possible. It is rehearsed for sure. It yeah. is. I mean, this is not rehearsed. Right. Believe me, I've never told this story in public. Oh, really? Yay. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a good story. You should but, tell it in uh, public. No, um, but and especially because right now I'm I'm really trying to advertise Stella, so the movie, right? Which the movie, also... which by the way is on demand, and you can get it anytime you want, and it's it's a beautiful movie. Everybody loves it, really. Yeah, really I, I did a, we're going to plug it too. And we're going to plug it at the beginning. We're going to remind everybody at the end too. Nice. Um, but I always tell people too that by listening to you in depth and hearing these stories that have nothing to do with the movie, people are going to get more into you. Yeah, they're going to sure. feel more attached to you yeah. and they're going to want to see your movie naturally Yeah, because you're an interesting person. Exactly. Yeah. But let's just go back to the movie for a sure. second. It's on demand anywhere so they can watch it on their computer on their tv yep um, itunes anytime. amazon prime on demand any anytime anywhere anyhow and my dog's name is stella you know i realized after this everyone's dog's name is stella let me tell you about this dog by the way do, do you know the story about i heard a little story because i did my research <laughs> but you tell the story because everybody listening probably doesn't know well um she you know usually when you make a movie or at least when I made the Naked Brothers band, we had dogs on that on that movie, and, you, and we hired them from dog trainers. But this um, this time, I had just read an article about how um, 
old dogs weren't getting adopted. And I thought, you know, it'd be great because our dog had just died. Maybe we can adopt an old dog and make her a star, you know. So, um, so I was looking through all these old dog adoption things, and they were all old but too young. They were they looked too frisky. It was and 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 so then they sent me a picture of this dog that was wearing sunglasses and a blingy necklace that they obviously put on her to hide the fact that she just looked so <laughs> old and sad and pitiful and i just fell in love immediately so i brought her home she she weighed almost a hundred pounds she was so fat with the thyroid problem and what kind of dog uh, no idea but we actually got her dna tested and it's half pit bull half every other kind of dog you okay know, rottweiler um Weimar on her, German Shepherd, you know, just a million different chow, every kind of dog in the rainbow. So, um, but I wanted her to look like an old dog that people have, that the this family has had since she was a puppy, because that was really the point was that they were putting their dog down to sleep. And the dog had meant a whole lifetime to them because they were, they were little when they got her. And their father in the story had died. And um, so they'd actually known the dog longer than they'd known their father. So the dog symbolized a lot of things for them in their lives. Anyway, we get this Stella home. She, Her name, it turned out, well, she was found on the street. She was a homeless person's dog. And so she had worms, fleas and ticks and a UTI and this thyroid condition and arthritis and she walked into our apartment and just peed a lake all over oh, and my kids thought geez. oh my god what my mom has officially lost her mind and we were wondering if she'd even make it to the filming because she was so messed up so then we got her on thyroid medication got rid of we got, to, got her on arthritis medication get, get, you know get, she fed her things other than pizza she used to just lay down in front of pizza parlors because obviously that was where she'd spent most of her time and she became like a, a phenomenal like springy perky dog oh really yeah so that by the time we were shooting the movie about the dying dog she looked like peppy dog <sighs> better than ever <laughs> right and that and Alex you said ruined her she was the hardest thing person to work with on the set because she was so had such joie de vivre to be there she kept licking them and and jumping on she was just so happy to get all that attention and so she must have not actually been that old then so exactly i think she just was you know just traumatized by living yeah. out on the street now she looks a lot older i mean she looks a lot better but a lot older if you see her in the movie she's giantly fat still but she lost about 10 pounds before and i think doesn't she have a little bit of white around her she, snout now too? she now she has massive amounts of white she had a little white. so this is you filmed it how many years ago then a couple of years ago Two. Yeah. oh okay she's now she's um but it was funny also because when I couldn't say action because um, if Stella was in the scene, because if she'd hear my voice, because she was so devoted to me, she'd just go find wherever I was behind the camera <laughs> and just sit there. I'd be like, what happened? What happened? Where's the dog looking at the monitor? And then she'd be there. That next is very to me. sweet. <laughs> well, that's the trouble with actually getting your own dog, training your own dog. Exactly. So. You found out later that everybody's dog is named Stella? Yes. Me too. I was the, annoyed because at Because of it. the thing. Stella, Stella. That, which is so clever. And that's what we do at the end of the movie, too. The father yells out, says that's why they named her Stella. But the funny thing was, who knows what her name was when she was the homeless person's dog. But then there was an interim person that called her Sasha. And I just have such a problem with names. Sometimes once I got off the train... Um, I was supposed to get off at Baltimore, Maryland, and I got off at Wilmington, Delaware, <laughs> because they sound alike in my head. And and I was supposed to go to Atlanta, Georgia, but instead I went to Savannah, Georgia, once because they sounded alike in my head. Anyway, so 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 Sasha and Stella sounded alike to me. I didn't choose the name because of the clever Stella. Stella. I just thought of that later, and um, so basically, um, that's. 
that's the weird circuitous route to how she got her name yeah well my, I'll what tell kind you of dog do you have so she's a black lab mix so we got her as a rescue and you said something else before that was funny to me about how you found her or the picture when we we she was rescued with a litter of puppies from the floods in West Virginia a few oh. years ago and so they brought a bunch of dogs up here and to like a little rescue adoption thing and we looked the night before to see what puppies and dogs were available and they had all the puppies from her litter dressed up in these bizarre like jewels <laughs> it's so it's like, works what? they it have like totally tiaras <laughs> like i'm like what who would do this to a puppy like it's so weird but all the puppies in her litter were je- just like that so we go my husband went up super early because we're like, please, these are little black lab puppies. Yeah. Like, they're going to go pretty quickly. Yeah. So he goes up super early. Like, it's still dark out. And just to wait in line. And then my son and I met him up there a little bit later. And so we went to see them. And there were still a bunch of them left. And a, her sister was named Stella. She was named Shelly. <laughs> and then all of them had, like, S names. Yeah. And I had already come in thinking I like the name Stella. If it's a girl, but I thought it was going to be a boy, we were going to name him Bernie. We thought that was the cutest <laughs> little so dog cute. name, right? And, like, it was, I guess, two and a half years ago. So Bernie Sanders was, like, right. fresh on Perfect. the mind. Yeah. So we're like, oh, Bernie would be the cutest puppy <laughs> name. But we need, like, an equivalent in, like, a girl's name. And that's what we thought of was Stella. And I had never heard of a Stella dog before. Anyway, we adopted her, named her Stella, changed it from Shelly to Stella. And then I found out like a few weeks later, one of my daughter's friends is like, oh yeah, Stella, that's the dog from Modern Family. Oh. And I was like, oh. That's why they're so many Yes, Stellas. and like everybody knows a Stella. I think it might be from Modern Family. Oh, wow. Uh, I couldn't believe it. I was like, oh, it's so, so common. Annoying. I gave her a it's common so common. Name. I know I hate her. I give her. I gave her a common name. <laughs> oh, dear God. But I She's going to be so aunt. upset. Right. But I had an aunt Stella, so I could I You could, could say, no, well, mine's say. named after my aunt Stella. Exactly. Interesting. Okay, well. Yeah. So, so that was the origins of the Stellas, I guess. Um, but uh, hmm. we were talking before as well about walking our dogs. And so I was saying that I like to listen to podcasts while I'm walking Love Stella. That idea. But you said you don't like walking the dog. Well, uh, do do most people like walking their dogs? Well, I, when I say walking the dog, I mean like I'm going, taking her for a long walk. Like okay, I'm out for 45 different. minutes. I'm lacing on my sneakers. Um, I'm putting my earbuds in, my headphones. My okay. kids tell me don't say earbuds. if you will, the only two dogs we've ever had. One was a French bulldog who would rather be carted around than walk anywhere. And the other is this old arthritic Stella who um, he doesn't want to go anywhere at all, but just to walk out to be in, including outside the apartment sometimes she'd be too exhausted to even she'd she'd walk to the to the to, you know right outside literally outside the apartment right on the front step the um like the stoop the stoop and just pee there <laughs> and i'd have to I'd just keep having to so no i don't see it as a big treat I feel you. I but get it. She likes to just stare at squirrels in the park. She doesn't like to chase them or do anything like that. She just likes to stare at them. So, so she does get excited about going to the park. She doesn't like right. playing with other dogs or doing anything. She's, you know, right. She's an old lady. She's a, she's a loving old lady that's cannot believe her luck she feels like she died and went to heaven with she the did. 17 she scored, virgins yeah. yeah she scored big time <laughs> yeah. when you decided to take her in yeah. and put her in she show became business. a movie star right. and she yeah so getting back to 30 something a second so uh, can we talk about ellen for a second your character sure. all right so looking back on ellen now i mean do you feel proud that you played her was she yeah. a good character you felt oh, like you yeah. feel now for I thought she was amazing. Oh yeah, I she was she such was a role. So I felt like she was a role model. Yeah, well, she was not for issues. that day and age. She wasn't a role model. She was she was the 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 bad single girl, but that was the a one role that model. doesn't. Yeah, now now it would be like the person that everybody accepts. That but then to be the one that didn't really want to get married and have kids was was a kind of a kind of a negative. It was. It, you that would that show was from the point of view of the married people with the kids and um a character who didn't didn't fit into that mold was not you know th- until they got some some great 
female writers for it 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 had a taint of the the annoying the annoying best friend that always takes up your time your that always um wants your wife's time when she has better things to do that's interesting i did yeah. not sense that i don't remember that and i haven't really seen the show since it was airing back when it did yeah but no she I, don't remember that. I thought she was a really interesting character it was a um it was a person that that had a lot of flaws and complications which to me is the most fun to play yeah, I remember a couple of scenes very well. So these are the ones that stand out for me. I remember one where you were meeting Hope for lunch. And I guess, did she bring the baby yeah, with her? Yeah, that was the pilot. That was the pilot? Yeah. Oh, okay. So she yeah. brought a baby or was she just breastfeeding and she, leaking? She brought her baby and to the to the restaurant and the baby was crying the whole time. Right, that was a disaster. Okay, that was the pilot. I remember also you looking in the mirror in the middle of the night and the mirror was like split. Oh, that's when I was having like mini nervous breakdown. Yeah. That's right. And you were looking at yourself in the mirror and it was such I, I don't yeah, remember. It was really that cool. was it just cool really shot. stayed with me. Yeah. That was so very... what which which scenes do you remember the most or that stick out? Um oh uh, well I don't know. I kind of, I I remember them for di- different reasons from the way the viewer would remember them like if I had a really fun time that day if we laughed a lot and had a blast like uh, Melanie and I did a episode on um, on video dating and the two of us were doing our video date videos you yeah know, yeah and um and in those days you had to go to a place that made you a video for your video dating and uh and Melanie and I just had so much fun that day. We were, I mean, it's a really funny scene where Ellen is taking it all very seriously, and but she has her hair is sticking straight up, and and she and someone has to tell her that she's she's being very earnest, but her hair is sticking straight up, and Melanie's character can't stop laughing. She just gets completely, you know, and can't she stop laughing. Giggles, she can't yeah. do it. Yeah. So I love that and. Um, I liked um, I liked the scenes with Woodman, the boyfriend, and I had in the first year because it was Terry Kinney, who's such a good actor. And um, I had fun on the episode where we had Carly Simon on because she's really a nice person, and we had a blast. God, I mean, I had I, I, my favorite day. I think was when the entire cast was together um, in a Thanksgiving episode. And we were all in the show. You know, we got to... The reason 30-something can't be shown now is because it has a bunch of Beatles songs and and Joni Mitchell songs and all these famous songs that we can't afford the rights to. And um, um, we were all sitting around singing Their Places I Remember, the John Lennon song. And it was... And it really was around Thanksgiving time. And... It was just a beautiful moment where it was such a great group of people that I love to be with, and we were all together in the same room, and it was a nice moment. That sounds amazing. And yeah. I'm sure anybody who loved the show will feel good to think about Hear that, that, right? Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That sounds amazing. So that Peter mentioned that too, that about the music, the, the it's so expensive now, yeah. which is why. So what the rights when it first aired, you could afford yeah, or because whoever there was could no afford such it then. Thing as, there was no such thing as streaming rights then. Or um, even was there a DVD? Yeah, there was DVD. I don't know. There was. It was just a network would buy it and put it on and and put it on their show. You couldn't get those right. You know, uh, singer songwriters bands didn't have that to go on. Now they do. Now, it's so a now they story. can retroactively ask for it. But aren't there other? Aren't there other shows that? No. No, what do you mean? No other shows no, than yeah, 30 one, something? The Wonder, the Wonder Years. The Wonder Years. That's the other one that can't get on. So those are the only two shows that used all these yep. songs? Get out of here. Yep. I know, isn't it crazy? That is crazy. And I you know. do remember the music being very impactful, Oh, of it's course. huge. It was a huge part of the show. Yeah, and Wonder Years as well. Yeah. So no one else thought to no. use... That's so weird to I me. I know. 
I'm going to I'm going to say this thing about this series now. I don't know if you have Showtime, but there's a series called Escape at Danamora and it's Ben Stiller made it. Um he produced I just it directed read something it. about it. Yeah. Yeah, so good. Really good. It's like seven episodes. Excellent. I recommend it. And the music is phenomenal. I can't tell you I don't remember exactly the songs, but that really struck me in the middle of it like was that expensive to get all these different songs yeah. that really fit right into what's going on? But I guess, I don't know. I don't know how that works today, but it's, it's complicated. Hmm. Um, and uh, with TV, I don't know. I've only done it with movies, and it's extremely expensive. Um, the the artists that I used in my movie is are all indie artists. I wanted a lot of them from New York indie artists, but there are a lot of indie artists, including my sons, actually. They're two, three of their songs are in it. But um, th- everybody is really costly. Uh, actually, I had to get I, I had to get Box of Rain in there. I went, there's a scene where Nat, um, Nat's character and I try to get the dog stone to make her feel better. And, um, and I wanted the background music to be Box of Rain. You barely hear it, but it was really important to me because actually it was important to me and to Nat because he was shooting a movie when he was 14 or 15 and I had to be his stage mom on the movie. And so I had to drive him every day to the set and we played Box of Rain and it was kind of a meaningful thing for us as a mother and son. So when we shot that scene he played Box of Rain before we shot it just to get, because he always plays music. He and Alex both uh, get a lot of their energy in acting from listening to music in their headphones. And um, something that I never never did, and it's a really cool idea, and especially for them because they're musicians, they, it, it brings feelings to them. Yeah, well, so, this music and emotions are, are very so connected. Ta- yeah, and um, uh, and I wanted everything in the movie to be emotion to, to to enhance the the. My husband did the score to the movie, but right. And your but husband is Michael. Of, he, Michael Wolf, and who you, was on the Arsenio Hall right. show as the band leader, and that's how we met. And that's how you yeah. met. <laughs> Can we sidetrack and you just yeah, tell yeah. the story yeah, of yeah. that? Um, we were in the hair and makeup trailer getting our hair ma- hair done and in the 80s that was a big deal you know hair was big. really big and his hair was almost as big as mine <laughs> <laughs> so we had a lot of time in there to talk and um but he didn't ask me out there he tried to ask me out through my agent and I wasn't sure what his name was I knew he was the band leader but I just didn't know I thought he was some guy I'd met in the dog park so wait I didn't what do you answer. mean he tried to Ask him to through his agent. What? Because he, you're not allowed, when you're there, you're not allowed to ask for any cast, any guest numbers. That's a rule. Who's not allowed to ask? The band or any oh. employees or anything. It's, a, you know. So he called my agent to ask for my number, to ask me out. And my agent said, this guy, Michael Wolf, wants to ask you out. And I thought it was some guy I'd met in the dog park. So I was like, mm-mm-mm. But also, why would so a guy the, in the dog park get your yeah. agent's number? How would- because anyone would call my, that, that's how you get actors' numbers, is that you, that you call their agent and then they... Right, so just a random guy in the dog park. Some ran, one of the you, random who guys in the, was. who was... Who, who was who, this guy in the dog park who you thought oh, he might were, be? You know, you just, I don't know. But when you're famous... <laughs> people come up to you Got because it. they like the show or whatever. Anyway, so um, they he left flowers at my door um, at my house and um, um, I was gone. I was doing a movie in Canada and so the flowers just died there and he kept driving around and around and watching them die as the days went on and then he refreshed the flowers <laughs> apparently Good so that when I got home they were there and he said something like I'm really glad you didn't turn your feet backwards and walk forwards like you did on the Pat Sajak show because before I got two hip replacements riding a mechanical bull I uh, I used to be able to turn my feet backwards and walk forwards I mean, what? This, uh, this is really a big segue Wait, please Yeah, um, I literally could take my heels and make them go forward and walk 
Like if you so saw you would, my you heels, would turn you'd your think they were my out? toes. Yeah. Because I have I don't what know, double that? jointed. I think that's more than double jointed. Yeah. I think it is. I think it's there's something really deeply wrong with my legs. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> Ellen is not the only one with flaws. No, just kidding. That's really uh, cool, actually. Very. And you it, never, well, I, I didn't see it as a fly. I saw it as a as an awesome. It is cool. icebreaker. But is also is that how people and have you ever seen like these contortionists or whatever? Yeah, I was kind of like that. I can also wrap my legs around. I can't really do anything now anymore because of the. I was told I couldn't by the guy who gave me the two hip replacements, which I did because I rode a mechanical bull thinking that it would be fine because I was directing an episode of the Naked Brothers Band and um, and there was a mechanical bull in the episode and the um, the stunt people were saying this is actually a very dangerous thing. So they were going very slowly on it and I said, well, that's not going to be impressive looking the, the is, can, can't they speed it up and they said no no it's dangerous and I said how hard can it be so I get on the mechanical bull and I was like a genius at it I just I stayed on I wrote it afterwards the guy who ran the thing who looked like um deputy he, who's that cartoon character with the mustache that goes oh, way like down? Sam, somebody? Sam, Sam, some, Sam, somebody. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Deputy Sam something, or something. Right, something yeah. like that. You, he you said, somebody Sam? No. Something no, like that, right? Yeah. Because, um, he said, you should have been a rodeo rider when I got off. So impressed was I. And also I was kind of like, you know, arrogantly strutting back to my chair saying, huh, well, look, I did it. And they turned it all the way up to, 12 and and I was fine and I sat down in my chair and I literally could not get up after that I ruptured four discs in my back and destroyed both my hips so so you didn't even know until you sat down that's wild yeah because I think my adrenaline was so kicking in my you know it was just like wow that was great it's like when people have knives in them and they're like oh I have a knife in me (laughs) you see that on tv but you don't think it would be real but it's it real. is it's so yeah. weird so i had to spend the whole rest of the season directing standing up i couldn't sit down i had to stand up and i couldn't go to the doctor yet because i had to and i was you know so and people had to um like grab the back of my pants to lift me upstairs to get me it was so sad that is really <laughs> an experience anyway so i cannot turn my feet backwards and walk forwards anymore which was a it was a big part of my identity <laughs> <laughs> that's so sad i wish you could still do that i would so love to see right? that yeah. So wait, well, what did that have to do with the flowers? What was the Oh segue? my God, I have no... That oh, does he, have something to do oh, with it, right? His note to me was, thank you for not turning your feet backwards and walking forwards on Arsenio Hall, on the Arsenio Hall show the way you did on the Pat Sajak show. Oh. Because there was a short-lived show that Pat Sajak of um, the Wheel letters, of Fortune. Yeah, Wheel of Fortune yeah. had. And I was on it. And again, out of entertaining things to do, I turned my feet backwards and walked forwards and i think it was so gross in fact when i saw it on camera i thought you know i don't think i'm gonna do that much more <laughs> you probably didn't have a publicist really then. good yeah <laughs> <laughs> that would not have happened That's not uh, today. really attractive at all so um i thought whoever this guy is he's got a really good sense of humor but uh, then i re- and also i knew it, who it was then that he was the cute band leader on the show so he had watched you on the passage actually so watch yeah he had been watching me oh. he'd been he says um he says now they would call it stalking but in his day they just called it ardent <laughs> pursual <laughs> <laughs> but he probably so back then you were on 30 something probably yeah. at the time so why wouldn't he know you right. or be ardently and he used to watch it because he he was uh, as well as being a jazz musician he was uh the reason he met arsenio hall was because arsenio was the com comedy act before the jazz act of nancy wilson where michael was the piano player and arsenio and he used to hang out a lot and arsenio said you know you're super funny and you would be a great if I if I when I get my talk show, you're going to be my band leader. And Michael was like, "Yeah, right." When you get your talk show, okay, looking forward to that time. And then, of course, it did happen. So 
That is so cool. cool. Yeah. So what is Arsenio Hall up to today? Do we know? What's he been doing? No, I know he has a kid that's the same age as Alex, my youngest. Okay. So who's 21, that means. And, um, you know, I think he's producing a lot of things. So he tried to do a second go at the Arsenio Hall show that lasted just a couple months, didn't go very well. Was Michael involved in that too or no? he wasn't involved in that. It was a whole different, you know. And so working together, you know, obviously you've been working with Nat and Alex for years and it's been successful. And And Michael Michael, too. Michael, I stuck him in the Naked Brothers Band as their father. Right, so he was in that and then you said he did the score, he wrote the score for Stella. Yep. Um, So... Do you have separate things too? Oh yeah, he's a he's a famous jazz musician okay. he, uh, that I have nothing to do with. Believe me, so I, guess the, the <laughs> I don't even is, understand jazz. I don't get it. I'm like, could you stay on the tune just a little longer, please? <laughs> right, right. Because a whole other uh, it's like uh, a, it's whole a whole other, other way of communicating. It's yeah. a language that I've tried to understand over the years, but it's it's kind of beautiful to watch jazz musicians play with and each they, other. They know they it. They know, they laugh, they have, you know, this beautiful communication. It's probably like acting in improv. I'm when I watch Im- people who can improv, I'm so astonished. So you started as an actor Right, but were you always eyeing the fact that you really wanted to direct, write, produce, or did that happen, just happened? You know, when in retrospect, I guess I always was, but I think that, um, I think that there was sort of a stigma attached to women, actresses, um, that did that kind of thing, that it was, it was a vanity production or it was a, you know, that if a woman did, now women are in, but um, women and, and, and who knows how long they'll be in before they get slapped down again. But, um, but I feel like it was always a little de classe to be wanting that kind of power to, to be the person that said, um, I want to write this and do this and direct this and produce this was and maybe it wasn't true but but I felt it and I'll tell you there are things that have happened in my career that make me know that I'm not I wasn't all making it up like for example when I had to join the Directors Guild I you know I the reason I had to join it wasn't like I was begging to get in I was I was the the showrunner and creator of a television series. So this so, is Naked Brothers. Yeah. Okay. So I got a call from the Directors Guild saying from a man saying um yeah, before we let you in, um we all were just concerned and wanted to um to make sure you knew that there's a difference between acting and directing. What? And yeah, and I was like, "What?" Just, you know, to make sure you knew that. And I said, "Yeah, I know that. Do you ask the your male actors who turn directors the same question?" I say, at which point he kind of crumbles and said, "It wasn't my question. Uh, they asked me to ask it. I'm sorry." And then he said, "But one more thing I I have to ask you. Um they wanted me to send you a book on directing, on how to direct. And I said, yeah, okay. Like, and then I asked, you know, other guys that were actors that, did they send you a book on directing? Did they ask you the difference between acting? And they'd be like, no. And then at that time, it was 10 years ago, there weren't that many women directors. They're Wait, just, this is only 10 years ago? Yeah. There weren't that many women directors 10 years ago. There aren't now. There only 8% of women are directors. So is this in television or television and film both? Or? Oh, it's the DGA. It's everything. Everything. Yeah. It's They're the only director's 8%? Guild. Yeah. That is super low. Yeah. It's really low. And now they're scrambling to try to make, but they're, they're not scrambling, uh, you know. They're not scrambling what, in the actual industry? 
They're not scram. They're scrambling to get women to direct episodic shows, like on someone else's show, or maybe to do, um, to 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 write something to say that they have this many women writers on their network. But um, generally speaking, it's a it's a it's a it's a boys world which is weird because um women directors makes perfect sense a woman who's a director it's kind of genius because they're good at they're 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 good at at smoothing over things and and bringing different elements together and being diplomatic and being creative and letting every single day on the set is like a war in terms of the the challenges that you're um, greeted with. So the idea that you have a woman whose mind is very flexible to say, okay, well, okay, so we can't use, there's no, they, they won't let us use their house, so we can't have a staircase. So we have it, you know, coming up from stairs from the subway if we need that shot of coming upstairs. It's just, you just have to, women are just, Flexible, flexible and, in right, general, uh, resourceful, <clears throat> more resourceful. Yeah, yeah. How are they trying to get? What are they doing to try to raise the number from eight percent specifically? Well, you said you see there's happening? been. First of all, if you think about it, you said you were on the set of Girls. Well, that show never would have happened if it weren't for a man, Judd Apatow. It wasn't like she went in there and and said, I'm going to do this show, and a, and a woman said, wow, a show about women, that's so great. No, it was a man who took the lead and said, I want this show about women. So it's always a man that's behind it, because the men are always the ones in the very top. So now she'll have her opportunity, maybe, right. and maybe that will breed other opportunities for women, but it's it's a... You know, and and honestly, I'm not bitter about it because I've been lucky enough to get my. I had a man who was my champion to get the Naked Brothers band. Albie Hecht was. <clears throat> if it weren't for him, it never ever would have happened. Never would have happened. So yeah. it was your idea, yeah. And you brought it to him, no. saying, "I need somebody." Or? No, I cre. I I did it. It was practically a home movie the way I did it. My, I did it as a family project with my kids because they had a band and I said you know it'd be really funny a movie that was like a mock documentary about a kid's band as if they were huge like the Beatles and meanwhile Alex was six and Nat was nine and but Nat was writing songs at a prodigy level I mean it was bizarre like one of his one of his songs was in the top 20 on the not even on the pop charts, on the charts. That's outrageous. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so they practically were that way. So anyway, I thought this would be fun, and and so I got all my friends together, my famous friends, so that it would get more visibility, and I got the kids with their band, their real band from preschool, and um, my brother was in it, my niece was in it, my nephews were in it, my husband was in it, I just put, our dog was in it, we put everybody in it for fun. And the movie, because it was so silly and so much fun, it was, it just was really good. No one could figure out what to do with it, it was turned down in every studio. So who presented it to every studio, so, who pitched it, you did? Um, no, CAA, the agency. Oh, okay, yeah. okay. But it was, but it was, it was a woman's name. project. It was a woman's project. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, oh, oh, and it was kids, women. It was just, it was, there was nothing about it that was appealing to any. And then this guy, Albie Hecht, saw it at a film festival and said, this has got to be at Nickelodeon. This is too good to pass up. And it was, the, there was a woman who was the head of the studio, but she was not pro the movie it was another person he and another guy pushed it through just endlessly because he used to be the head of Nickelodeon and then he was an independent producer and he worked it and worked it and worked it and then finally they 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 did a test with kids and it scored like a hundred percent or something because uh -huh, uh -huh. it was such a I mean with kids, they'd never seen anything like it, and they, 
they were blown away by it. It was just so much fun. Right. So it spoke for, it was easy, an easy sell at that point. Easy sell for kids. For kids. See, as but long as you got it to the kids, that's what I always knew. Right. If you didn't be, get it to the kids, yeah, it the, would The, the would adults die. thought it was just a little too irreverent and too, you know, too double, too sassy, too um, tongue in cheek, too many, uh, you know, references that adults would only get. That wasn't true. The kids got them too. Anyway, um, and then it became the, their biggest hit, live action hit. So, so after <clears throat> that, did you feel like you were able to speak for yourself and yeah. not have a man championing you? I did have more power then, and they did listen to me more then. But he always was the one who who um made it happen made for you it happen mm, yeah mm, that's so interesting. He, he always was the one if anything was really difficult it would be him man not mansplaining because right. he didn't do it but him <laughs> him managing it to them to, right the mansplaining was the director's guild yeah, to that you was, yeah that was the director's guild. right yeah and that's been i mean Maybe it doesn't happen anymore. I, I would love to hear that. I was on a panel with um, these women in Savannah. <laughs> I got to Savannah. I saw some of that. That's online. If yeah. anyone wants to look at that, yeah. you, they can, you can listen or watch on uh, YouTube the whole It's so panel. interesting. Like an hour All of long. them talking about how they, what they really want is for people to be considered on their own merit. But at this point, it's like with the ACLU. There, if there aren't enough people you have to if there aren't enough of this type i.e. half the population i.e. women then then you have to create a situation an environment where they can be but I think men for some reason feel like it's 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 the being in charge that they don't that they they feel is the man's domain so do you feel like this will change the more with the age like as younger people grow up I feel like it's a different generation, right, coming so that it's got to shift at some point. I think point. it will. Like in everything almost, right? The old in guard everything. is kind of like leaving or whatever. I, and I then... wish they would leave. My God. <laughs> <laughs> the old guard is digging its heels in right now. Uh-huh. The, uh-huh. the young people are speaking and speaking and speaking and it's 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 coming up against a brick wall with the old guard. Yeah, but at a certain point, don't you think there's got there has to be just a nut because it's a numbers thing that with the more that the new attitude comes Absolutely. in, the more things have to change. I think well, I'm just not sure. At a very visceral level, I think that my sons are um, they just understand things from a, they don't see that 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 gender thing is being any kind of stumbling block they had a bunch of fluid gender friends and they have women friends and men yes. friends and mm-hmm. they it's don't so it's so it. different it's so they different. don't see it differently no. I mean, that, right it's so they different always for find me asking questions annoying like really are they so they consider themselves a boy now but they were <laughs> actually a girl yes mom yes geez you know? But it's like second nature to yeah, them. It's so second nature normal. to them. It's so or normal. Or like natural or whatever, yeah. which is different, but it is really like across the board. I have the same thing with my daughter who's 18. Same thing. Like it's amazing how the views are different. They just see yeah. things and they really like, it's almost like putting a mirror up. To, I mean, I'm not that old, but at the yeah. same time you can see like, oh, there is still a lot that I'm used to that's going out the door absolutely you know what i mean i'm not saying these are things that i agree with but it's like great it's going out the door but it is you don't always see the things that you grow up with no they're not growing up they're growing up they're not growing up with that it's interesting to say exactly i mean there's some good things that that i grew up with sure like what um well not having iphones i think yeah i mean i know that i'm just addicted to mine and i know that it it precludes a lot of other creative endeavors um i know that my kids who are super creative and are always writing music or writing scripts or alex just wrote it wrote his own and directed his own movie um himself um they weren't allowed to have um to watch tv during the week or to have um iphones for a really long time so i think that maybe that they were they were the last my last holdout against 
that tide. But now it's... I think also, I think they were the... They're still technically millennials, yeah, right? right? They're millennials. I think that's different from yeah. Gen Z. Yeah, right. Who, right, like my daughter's 18. I think she's right at the beginning You're of Gen right. Z. They're the first ones to really grow up their whole lives with iPhones. You're right. And I was a holdout too. Like she didn't get hers until she was a lot older than her friends. Same with my son. And my third is little, so he doesn't... I mean, a lot of his friends already have them. He's of 10. Of course, yeah. I but know. he's not going to have one anytime right. soon. But still so many of them do yeah. that it really is like the millennials still um kind of at least we're a little safe some yeah yeah so we did the same thing but when it's so everything around you all the kids, it's so pervasive yeah. it's really tough to have that kind of impact yeah oh god it's yes. tough for sure it's a trade-off there are there are good things that have come from like what's going yeah. on now and bad things well the the, the heather graham was one of the the um participants in this panel of women directors and she said something about it would be really nice to for there to be a time when women can can be praised for their femininity and also be in charge that they don't have to pretend to be men in order to be um considered leaders sure because they're different aspects yeah. that don't have to be in competition exactly but, right it's hard to find that it is and especially spot. for someone like heather graham who's so beautiful and has been sort of considered a sex object was one of the harvey Harvey Firestein, I was going to say Harvey Weinstein um, people. That right, that's an that unfortunate he, name that for Harvey Firestein. Right? He's right? like, that's, it's not me. Right. Believe me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that's, interested. <laughs> that's a good impression of him. <laughs> it's so sad for him, really. That it, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny I almost had him on the show too but he has a new play and it was, he was oh, too yeah. busy um, so but I was thinking to myself like people would see his name as the podcast app comes up yeah. and they would see Harvey and Firestein like, what <laughs> <laughs> but that might be they want to hear what the dude has to say right? <laughs> or but they I boycott would... <laughs> it or they'd be mad at you or, exactly yeah, there'd have to be oh god <laughs> it would be a reaction it would be a reaction else, right? I would have, have to, to say, say right off the Firestein. bat Firestein right. Firestein <laughs> this may not be who you think different, it is different different um, um, yeah, but I interrupted what you were saying. What were you saying? No, that's that basically that 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 a woman could be in her whole form, yeah, not having to only show one part of herself because she's worried that um, that the other parts won't be accepted or the other parts will distract from her her being smart, right? You know that that a person can have all those things working at once looking back on your life which you know there's still a long, long life ahead of you but looking back now do you have any regrets or maybe there's one thing that you wish you had done differently I don't think I can ever have any regrets because everything that I did led to what I did um, initially I regretted that I had gone to drama school because I thought it's not really useful because I should have just been out in the world acting because an actress's window of opportunity is so short. But recently I've realized how important that was that I know, so, you know, dra um, it was Yale Drama School and they're, they're, it's such a um, all-absorbing schedule. It's got such, you know, you learn so much about Shakespeare and Chekhov and... I feel like I have such a broad-based knowledge because of it. And I wouldn't have said that maybe 15 years ago, but I would say it now. So I'm not sure I have. Um, do you have regrets? Oh, that's interesting. Um, yeah, I do. Not many, though. I always say my only regret, but I've been saying this for so many years, I may need to reevaluate like right? you have See? done. I have always <clears throat> said that my regret is Right after college, I started working, and this sounds so ridiculous, but um, I really almost worked on a cruise ship for a year. Oh, right? I have you all these jobs, done that. and I wish that I had done that. I yes. wish I had taken a year and just worked on a cruise ship. But it's, I'm, as I'm saying this, I'm remembering that that's part of the regret 
The other one that I have said since then is that I, I always thought to myself when my kids were really young that I wanted to be an expat with them. I wanted them to have a few to years live growing in up Paris in Paris or something. Yes. Yep. Paris, anywhere, Italy, farm, village, oh, city, so anything. Good. Oh, now because, you're giving me all sorts of regrets. Right? <laughs> because we've tra- we traveled a lot with them yeah, when they were little. So too. as we were traveling, I thought to myself, this is wonderful, but I want them to really be in this yeah, place or yeah. one of these places for a few years. I didn't even need to be there permanently. So that we could have done it, I That's think, but it nice. was impractical. It was impractical and it was you had other things going on and you didn't. I know. But we could have done it. Right. We could have done it and we mm-hmm. didn't. And I knew when we didn't that it was going to be It a was regret. a window that was closing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, maybe they will live somewhere else at some point, but it's not the same no. as us as a family unit growing up with them, that. growing up in that way. So that is a regret. No, that's, that's, you've just given me that as a, <laughs> now a new regret. It replaced your drama school and the, regret. And that and the cruise ship. <laughs> I'm like, oh, fuck. Right. <laughs> you could have been a cruise director or a performer. A cru- you could or have no, written the show. just had that summer on the cruise ship that would have, <laughs> actually, I'm not sure a cruise ship, but something like that where where it's somewhere where you're yes. just no ties to anything. Yes, but the cruise ship, I remember in the college newsletter or newspaper, they would always have these ads in the back, like the classifieds, like right. cruise ship, hiring, to college grads. Yeah. So they were all over. They were asking for people like us to do to, to yes. be unmoored for a for exactly. a summer exactly yeah. but i didn't so those two that's it so now you have the same two regrets <laughs> now as i have three now i have just three regrets no <laughs> well, no no, 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 no i'm not going to regret anymore now yet. we have identical no. regrets yeah. now we have identical regrets <laughs> twins chicks <laughs> <laughs> That was Polly Draper. You can watch Stella's Last Weekend on demand right now. You can also hear an extra bonus five minutes of Polly and me chatting it up. It's available right now, but only at reallyfamouspodcast.com or on patreon.com. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com slash reallyfamous. You can see Polly reacting to this interview after it was over. Just follow me on Instagram or Twitter, and you'll get a lot of other goodies there, too. By the way, it was Dr. Katz's professional therapist, that show that I was thinking about, but I was totally wrong. It was not on HBO. It actually aired on Comedy Central. Last but not least, if you find that Letterman episode that Polly can't find anywhere, tell me about it, please, and I will tell her. Just email me really famous podcast at gmail.com that's really famous podcast at gmail.com 
Thanks for listening to Really Famous. I'm Kara Mayer Robinson, and I very, very much appreciate you tuning in. Let's plug it one more time and tell okay. everybody where they can okay, perfect. see the movie. So what are the deets? All right. It's called Stella's Last Weekend. It stars Nat Wolf and Alex Wolf, and I play their mother in it. And it you can get it on um, iTunes, Amazon Prime, um, on demand, millions of different platforms. And uh, it's so worth it. You will love it. Cool. Really love it. It's very funny, by the way. Okay, Very so it's fun. funny and it's emotional, funny. right? You it's get a little touching. Of both. It's got great acting in it. It's got it's beautiful, and there's a dog. Yay! Nothing wrong with that. No. Name yeah. Stella, a rarity. <laughs> <Name> Stella. <laughs>